Hello, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm gonna to be checking out the HBO show, The Last of Us. I've never played the video game, I know. <laughs> I've heard it's amazing, but in this video, we'll be breaking down the injuries and some of the medical science behind what the hell causes this zombie infection. Spoilers for the first episode, also a content warning, as some of this is gonna be pretty gory. So let's go on with it. Mr. Newman, you're also an epidemiologist. I presume the prospect of a viral pandemic keeps you up at night as well. No. No? no. <laughs> well, it probably should do. All of us have gone through a viral pandemic, would probably agree it's no walk in the park. Sometimes millions of people die as in an actual war, but in the end, we always win. Uh, but you, uh, just to be clear- Okay, you... to be fair to this guy, I sort of know where he's coming from. He's trying to look at it from the most binary, basic outcome of human survival, yes or no. And if we're doing that, we probably want to put a fungal pandemic fairly low down on the list and at the top definitely climate change not bacteria not viruses so fungus <laughs> <laughs> i think people are kind of right to snigger at this a little bit we've never had a pandemic of a fungal infection probably because the human to human transmission is pretty lousy, so in general, they are not very contagious. Fungi tend to infect you from exposure in the environment. Most common fungal infections probably firstly is thrush, although this isn't really contagious. When you have an infection, it's more likely an overgrowth of your natural flora, as it naturally colonizes you and doesn't usually cause a problem unless you're immunocompromised and then it can be invasive and really pretty serious. Mold exposure can also mean you get an infection from Aspergillus. Usually isn't a problem, but can be really nasty, mostly again in people that are immunocompromised, but again, not contagious. You only catch this from breathing in the mold that's in the environment and not caught from someone else. Having said all that, the World Health Organization for the first time in October 22 released their list of 19 fungi that are of public health concern, citing increasing resistance, lack of testing globally, and a limited treatment. Only four classes of antifungals exist. Psilocybin, also a fungus. Viruses can make us ill, but fungi can alter our very minds. This is really very clever. I never thought about the link between psychedelics like LSD and magic mushrooms and these chemicals potentially being used by fungi as a virulence factor, so to control the host to change their behavior and encourage further spread. Now this type of thing in general to induce a behavior change is absolutely something that happens. For example, bacteria and viruses irritate our airways when we have a cold, so we cough or sneeze, meaning we propel more of the germs into the environment with the potential to infect others. But obviously this isn't changing our actual minds, but the fact of the matter is that fungi can produce these chemicals which can affect our minds. I think a really clever launching board for the story. There's a fungus that infects insects, gets inside an ant, for example, travels through its circulatory system to the ant's brain and then floods it with hallucinogens. Yeah, so zombie ants. So any fans of The Last of Us, but also any fans of David Attenborough will know exactly what this scientist dude is talking about. We're talking about cordyceps, so a fungus that infects insects. Once the fungal spores are eaten by the insect, the insect has its brain hijacked by hallucinogenic chemicals, all while it's being consumed from the inside out by the fungus. The brain altering nature of the cordyceps is actually key to its spread. In the case of the bullet ants, it makes them seek higher ground. And then once the fungus has eaten through its host, it is nice and high up. So it then releases its spores and therefore can infect a further area. This strategy are likely to work on humans. If you ever see a goggly eyed dude looking a bit weird, climbing up a tree and then growing a giant spore out of his head. Um, I'd put an N95 mask on before <laughs> going to see what's happening. Fungi cannot survive if its host's internal temperature is over 94 degrees. And currently there are no reasons for fungi to evolve to be able to withstand higher temperatures. That is a pretty dense exposition heavy intro, but really well done and the science, you can't really fault it. Fungi and bacteria do prefer lower temperatures and this explains the reason why we get a fever when we are sick. This actually makes it harder for our own bodies too, but it makes it harder disproportionately 
for the pathogens as well. And the show goes on to echo what the World Health Organization state. What if, for instance, the world were to get slightly warmer? That as fungi adapt to the increasing global temperatures due to the climate crisis, they'll find it easier to spread. Although there are two Quite large leaps in logic here. Firstly, that there is some combination of chemicals that a fungus could secrete to make a human into an effective killing machine. It is far more likely that you'd just be a poorly coordinated mess like anyone with large amounts of hallucinogens in their system. And secondly, that there are no cures. As we said earlier, there are four classes of antifungals, although we are beginning to see an increase in cases of multi-resistant fungal strains. Finished. I'm already finished. You should go home. Pretty good advice during a pandemic to stay at home. We've all been there, we all remember those days. It's hard to watch shows like this and not relate it to our own experiences of the pandemic. Those kind of early days not quite knowing what was happening and kind of the fear of the uncertainty of how it was gonna unfold. Although I think we were fairly confident that it wouldn't end up as a zombie apocalypse. Oof, okay, so I see a lot of blood here. It looks like a serious neck injury. The neck being one of the last places you want to see blood spurting from because it's not like you can whack a tourniquet around it. Every time I see blood like this, I'm always reminded of the medical adage, blood on the floor and four more, meaning you have to be concerned about a patient bleeding out if you see blood on the floor or any signs of internal bleeding into the four main cavities of the body. Grandma has finally lost it. This is super clever, actually. So grandma isn't actually eating the victim. She's just there breathing in and spreading the spores onto someone else, which as sick as it sounds, is what you would want if you were the fungus because you want another vector, another human to be alive. If this didn't happen, the disease wouldn't spread. I mean, look at something like Ebola, very deadly disease, but its spread is often limited because it kills people too quick before it can spread to others. Also, worth remembering that germs don't have a conscious thought. They don't wake up one day and think, I'm gonna try infecting someone with this method. They just mutate and if something works, it becomes successful and more likely to spread. So I'm probably guilty and lots of others are probably guilty of giving them more credit than they deserve. Sir, we are not sick! No. Okay, you're okay. You're okay, move your hand, baby. Move your hand. Oh man, so uh, this is heartbreaking. His daughter suffers probably multiple gunshot wounds here to the abdomen, so high velocity penetrating trauma. The concussive force that spreads out from the bullet tract here would no doubt rip through all the blood vessels around the gut, a very vascular organ, and you'd be lucky to avoid several of the larger blood vessels too, like the aorta, vena cava, the renal artery and vein and the iliacs too. Any significant injury to any of these would mean you'd lose consciousness within seconds, never to wake up again. Your only hope is to compress the area and immobilize the patient to stop blood loss and also to help encourage a clot, but they need urgent surgery to repair those damaged blood vessels. Even with all that, you're relying on a lot of luck to keep you alive. Clearly in this desperate situation, he's not gonna be able to do any of these things. And so we see the inevitable, his daughter sadly dies in his arms. Nice, okay, so we see a glimpse of some of the public health notices that have been put out. We see the incubation period of the fungus and it's frighteningly fast, somewhat unrealistically fast. Neck, face and head, it takes five to 15 minutes for full infection. Now I'm not sure what full infection means. I'm guessing it's all out, violent, worst day of my life, I'm real pissed zombie mode that we saw earlier. Now, in reality, there is just no way an infectious disease could have an incubation period of 15 minutes. Whether you're bitten, 
directly on the face or whatever. And the reason is biology just cannot replicate things that quickly. Take Candida albicans, the fungus that causes thrush, in its best conditions only doubles around every hour. This resulting in an incubation period of a few days. However, there is another possibility that when people are initially bitten, they get a high dose of the fungal toxin, so the brain altering chemical, and it's actually this that causes the symptoms, not the actual infective organism. And so what this is doing is effectively getting the hallucinogen into the bloodstream directly, which absolutely could work within five minutes probably even quicker. Although this has problems because if this theory is true, then these newly infected people wouldn't actually be able to infect people very easily or probably at all because they currently do not have high numbers of fungal cells in their body for them to shed them and then spread them or produce enough toxin themselves to pass that on in a bite. This one's done. So in Joel's words, we see a human who is done. We've got to a point where the fungus has consumed all of the human tissue and flesh and it effectively dies, both the human and the fungus. Without knowing anything about the fungus, you would be concerned for the spores in the air here. So this is an enclosed space and these spores can live for between hours and weeks depending on the fungus. But I trust the characters within their universe to know that they are not, uh, at risk of getting infected here. And the production team have done a phenomenal job and slightly horrified in recreating the end result of the cordyceps infection here. You know, it kind of mirrors what we see, what we see it does in insects into humans. Pretty nasty stuff. So there you go. I hope this video hasn't put you off your cordyceps supplements. I thought it was a brilliant first episode in terms of the story, the way it was shot, the action sequences. In terms of the medical science, often these zombie movies, it's kind of best not to mention the science behind the disease because it kind of makes no sense when you pick it apart. But in this, the freaking fungus actually exists in nature. And I'd never really made the connection between fungi as a pathogen and fungi producing these brain altering chemicals and what could possibly happen if they were combined. And when they do combine, we've seen here that it solves one of the problems of fungi not being very contagious because it induces people into a state of frenzy where they're violent and then get very close to people, meaning people get high doses and they get very close contact, which makes the spread happen. Anyhow, those are just my thoughts on the first episode. Obviously, I don't know much more about the lore of the show, so if there's anything I've missed, please let me know in the comments. I'm sure there's loads of stuff. Also, if there are any other shows you want me to check out, then please leave a comment below. I've covered a bunch of kind of infectious zombie movies before. And because you've watched this far, I think this deserves a thumbs up and consider subscribing too. I'd love to have you on board. And it just leaves me to say, I hope you're all well. Thank you for all the support on the channel and I'll be back soon.